Hello KubeCon for this last day on Friday. My name is Thomas. I'm one of the creators and maintainers of Cilium. And Cilium is one of the popular Kubernetes networking implementations. And based on what we have learned creating Cilium and working with many of you, I would like to share how to survive day two and how to troubleshoot Kubernetes networking. So a bit of context, I'm one of the maintainers of Cilium. So what I'm sharing today, of course, has a bit of Cilium context because I've been mostly working with Cilium the past few years. But the exercises or the best practices and how to approach this is, of course, not at all specific to Cilium and can be applied regardless of what Kubernetes networking implementation you are using. For those who have never heard about Cilium, Cilium is a CNI plugin, among other things. It is a CNCF project at incubation stage. But Cilium does not only provide networking or CNI functionality, which is what we will focus on today. It also provides service mesh and Hubble. And a lot of what we will hear about today is made possible by Hubble or tools similar to Hubble. Hubble is the observability layer of Cilium. Then we also have in the Cilium family Tetragon, which is providing runtime security and security observability. All aspects of Cilium are being done using a technology called eBPF, and that's actually what's enabling a lot of the observability that we will see today, which will assist you in troubleshooting. For some, in particular in the last part of the talk, we'll also look at layer seven latency or HTTP latency. Some of that work is done through Envoy, the Envoy proxy, which is also a CNCF project. So let's jump into Kubernetes networking, or how some people call it the dark side of Kubernetes. How many of you are familiar with the core concepts of Kubernetes networking? Excellent, almost everybody. So this will probably be a repetition for, for most of you, but if you've never heard about or have never seen how Kubernetes networking works, this may help you understand the rest of this talk. First of all, Kubernetes networking is very simple and basic. All pods have an IP address, which means every individual pod has an IP address. They can directly talk to each other. There is no specific network topology required. Kubernetes makes a simple assumption that we have a flat, so-called flat layer three network. Pods have IPs and thus pods can talk to each other. This is sometimes implemented differently depending on whether you're running in the cloud or whether you're running on-prem. You may be running BGP on-prem, you might be using the cloud provider SDN as you're running in the cloud, or you might be running an overlay. Doesn't matter, all of, the, the, all of these implementation principles implement this basic foundation. Typically, this is not true for all Kubernetes implementations, but typically every node has a so-called pod side or range which means pods on a particular node will have IPs assigned to that node. So that's a particular set of IPs, and all pods on that node will have an IP out of that range. Some implementations do this differently and allocate a unique IP. But there is a concept, you may see this in Kubernetes, called the pod side range, or per node pod side range. Kubernetes uses services for load balancing. You're probably using this all the time. This is the load balancing layer of Kubernetes. This is what's allowing us to have multiple replicas of a pod address a single service name or single cluster IP, and Kubernetes will load balance to any of those replicas. We'll look into some troubleshooting there as well. And then, of course, Kubernetes uses DNS for service discovery, so you can address a service by its name using DNS instead of hard coding IP addresses into the application. And then as the last principle of Kubernetes networking, there is network policy. Network policy is what implements the segmentation. So network policy is what allows you to define which parts can talk to which other parts. You could be doing segmentation maybe on namespace level. So maybe you want to allow within a namespace, you want to allow communication, but across namespaces, communication should not be allowed. Or you can even do this at the pod level and essentially say that only certain parts can talk to certain other parts. This is called Kubernetes network policy. And as we will see in the demo later on, plays a huge role in some of the troubleshooting. 
This slide looked very simple, right? It looks beautiful. Kubernetes networking is very, very basic. As you learn Kubernetes, as you run Kubernetes, um, I did this slide back in 2021. That's a bit, little bit more how it looks like in practice, right? So you have an overall goal, which is to forward together, to do network forwarding. You have IP tables somewhere, somewhere. You have queue proxy using IP tables. You have an application team trying to schedule 5,000 services, really putting stress on queue proxy. You have the liveness probes succeeding, so the applications seem like they're up and running because they're not aware of the actual network underneath, so the applications are just reporting, hey, I'm healthy, I'm healthy, I'm healthy, but they're not at all because they're actually not even reachable. And you may have a platform team that is completely ignoring the crash loop back of a coordinates pods. That may be more closer to the um, reality sometimes. So this talk is giving you tools on how you can look into this and figure out where the problem actually is. So let's dive one step deeper into Kubernetes and see how this is actually implemented. Because as we troubleshooting, as we troubleshoot networking, it helps to understand the base concepts of how the CNI actually works in a Kubernetes cluster. And this is true for all CNIs. It's a core concept of Kubernetes. So if you have multiple nodes, and we have pods running on the nodes, and of course containers running inside them. We then have a network CNI level or layer, which typically runs as an agent or as a daemon set on all the nodes. And the CNI then essentially spans the network plane, which allows the pods to talk to each other. Kubernetes itself does not have a built-in networking layer. It requires, there's a default CNI, KubeNet, but it requires the CNI plugin to actually allow pods to talk not only across nodes, but even inside of the node itself. And then we have KubeProxy, which is the default implementation to implement Kubernetes services and as well coordinates which is not in the picture here. When we implement this with Cilium, this looks very similar, right? We have Cilium that provides the networking data path, and then we have eBPF, which is doing the implementation of that and is actually causing the packets to be forwarded or network policy rules to be implemented. The last concept we need to understand before we get, can get a little bit more hands-on is Hubble. Hubble is based on top of Cilium and provides observability. There is no demand, there's no requirement for a CNI to actually provide observability. The standard only demands for pods to be able to connect to each other and everything else is optional. So even that our policy implementation is actually optional. So a CNI can, pro can provide as little as just pure network connectivity. With Hubble, we are essentially providing additional observability tooling in the form of flow logs, who is talking to whom, and metrics. It's essentially a TCP dump for Kubernetes because in the early days of Kubernetes, many of us have been executing into a node or into a pod and literally running TCP dump to somehow figure out what is going on on the network. And for those of you who have never heard about TCP dump, it's a 25 year plus year old tool, which has obviously never been intended to be used for an environment like Kubernetes. Hubble has native integration with Prometheus and Grafana, so you are not looking at, you can, but you not, don't have to look at the terminal. You can look at dashboards and at uh, Prometheus metrics. Let's look at a couple of examples and we'll jump into a live demo afterwards. So we can, for example, look at Grafana-based panels. How many packets are we forwarding? What is the drop rate? So how many packets, how many network packets are getting dropped by the network layer? Um, what is the total amount of traffic being forwarded? Or we can even create dashboards to display how much cross-region, cross-AC network traffic do I have in my cloud? Because that's usually what your cloud provider charges a little bit extra for. That's the Grafana view. We also have a Hubble UI service map where you can see all the services that are running and how they are talking to each other. So here we actually see the individual network connections and the API calls for application protocols that we understand. These are HTTP, gRPC, Kafka, Cassandra. So we're not only showing you who is talking to whom, we can even show you with Hubble what type of API calls they are making or what is the request 
response latency for a gRPC call. And on the lower part, you actually see the live flow data this service map is being based on, because what you're seeing here on the screen is derived completely transparently. This is not requiring changes in the application. It's essentially Hubble running transparently on the node and extracting all the connectivity data transparently, and then we can calculate what we call the service map um, from that data. And the raw data is what you see in the lower part of the screen. As a last concept, the Kubernetes service implementation, and there is, this is, if we would go into a lot of details, several types of services. For the purpose of this talk, I will keep it simple and talk about cluster IP. So this is the ability to expose multiple pod replicas via a single IP, a single cluster IP, which means that instead of being aware of the potentially hundreds or even thousands of pod replicas to talk to, I can talk to a single cluster IP. And this cluster IP will then get load balanced to any of the hundreds or thousands of pod replicas. And of course, you do not want to talk specifically to an IP, so you will, Kubernetes allocates a service name for you and makes that available as a DNS name via core DNS. So essentially, your application talks to the service app name and Kubernetes takes, takes care of the rest for you. Let's jump in into the first demo and actually show you how to troubleshoot some problems. And I figured let's start simple and use a very basic network policy example because what could possibly go wrong there, right? In this simple example, we'll have a front-end and a back-end pod and we'll do a network policy that will look something like this. So this is a Kubernetes network policy. And this policy, for those of you who have used this before, this will look very, very simple. We're allowing from the front-end pod to talk egress, so out outgoing egress, when we are networking people, we call egress the outgoing side and ingress the incoming side. So we are creating a policy that the front end part is allowed to talk to the back end part. And does somebody already see the problem with this? If so, yes, I see one hand. <laughs> excellent, excellent, right? Well, it looks very simple, like what could go wrong? So let's actually try this out. So I have this running right here. So the pods are up and running, and they seem to be pretty happy. Is it big enough? I think so. They're up and running, right? So this is probably good. But actually, under the hood, this is not good at all. And it's pretty, pretty hard to actually even see this, because as I mentioned, the, the health check here, the application is reporting just fine, the, app, the application is up and running. In this case, the application, they may actually be complaining, hey, my app, my app is not really working even though it's up and running, what is going on? So let's actually start looking below the hood what we can see on the network observability side. So I'm swapping over to the Grafana dashboard of Hubble UI. And we'll start out with the overall view. This is the cluster-wide view of everything that is going on in this cluster. Here we see the total amount of traffic being forwarded. We see the total of endpoints. That's the total of pods running in these clusters. We see the number of nodes. We see that we have no unreachable Cilium nodes. We, have, we see that we have no warnings or, 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 or errors being reported by any of the agents. We do see a bunch of DNS errors, though. That's probably, so if we zoom in here, uh, that's probably something we should be looking into. So we have quite a few DNS errors that are ongoing. We also see that we have policies loaded. So we have 16 policy loaded. We can look at the enforcement status, and we see have, we have 53 pods which have pod network policy enforcement enabled, and we have 61 pods which have no network policy enforcement enabled at all. We can move forward and actually see, oh, we have like some missing DNS responses. We can look into the connection tracking table and so on, a lot of, a lot of information. In this case, I actually know that something is wrong potentially with this application, front end and back end, and this is exposed into a namespace that I know. So I will go over here and actually look into this KubeCon simple namespace. This is where front end and back end is, is, is running in. And it's very interesting. We can see there's some, some, uh, some flows being forwarded. We can scroll down. 
And here we go, we see network policy drops, right? We see a constant rate of network policy drops from the front end. We can then go deeper and actually look at, well, where are these network policy drops? Where are these packets attempting to go? We can zoom in here and we see, huh, this is going to the cube DNS part. So what is wrong? At this point, we know that something is being, being dropped. So let's figure out what's actually being dropped. So I'll go back into my terminal here. And I will look, I will use the Hubble observe CLI command. So this is the, the CLI that will uh, allow me to query Hubble. I will run that, and it will show me all the network drops and all the forwarded flows that is happening in this namespace because I ran it with the dash and kubecon simple namespace filter. And yes, indeed, we are seeing drops from the front end part to the kube DNS part. So we've troubleshooted it down from the high level overview where we saw we have some policy drops to the namespace view where we actually saw this was going to kube DNS. And then we, with Hubble CNI, we were able to see the actual real drops. So we go back to the slides. It was indeed DNS, as, as often the case for many incidents, right? Even though it was actually not obvious at all, I think a lot of application teams will inject the network policy. They will not understand that, or may not understand that, I also need to allow to cube DNS. I need DNS for my service. So let's go to the Hubble UI. This is the, the service map with the view on just that namespace. And we see, in fact, that we only have communication from the front end to uh, kubedns. And we actually see in the lower part, it's a bit small maybe, but it's, these are all dropped flows. So this is all being dropped. Could even click on one, and it would tell me the, the drop reason is policy denied. So let's actually fix this. So let's allow core DNS. So I have a policy allow DNS. See if that works. Yeah. So I created this policy allow DNS. So this is the policy which, on top of the policy that already have, now allows to cube DNS. And bam, we can go back into the service map, and we now see not only connectivity to kube DNS, but also to the backend service. And we now see new forwarded flows in green. Those are allowed flows. So we fixed our problem. Now, how, do I, how did I get to this policy, to this allow kube DNS policy? Of course, you can ask ChatGPT today, right? If you don't know how to use that yet, <laughs> you can also use what we have, what we call the network policy editor. This is available for everybody, editor.networkpolicy.io. It's free, you can use it. And it will visualize network policies for you. And right now, I've loaded the original policy. And based on the graphic you see in the top, you can actually see that, yes, indeed, we are allowing to the backend, but we are not allowing to kubedns. You can see the arrow is actually red. I can now quickly allow this, go in here, allow rule, and it has now extended our existing policy to allow DNS, and you can see the new YAML that was added below, which will actually allow kubedns. So if you don't know how to get to the YAML yourself, Network Policy Editor can do this for you, or even in the visualization, you can see the problem straight away. If you do not know the namespace specifically where the application is running, we have what's called a policy verdict dashboard. This is this one cluster-wide, and we see a whole bunch of drops being on, go, going on. So you probably need to look into, well, what are the drops I care about? So there is actually a namespace level view down here where we can in see, in, in, indeed see that we have drops from the front end cube simple part into the cube system cube DNS part. So this is another way. If you are not sure which application is even affected, you can go in here and see all the drops by name, filtered by namespace across the cluster. So this is how the policy looked like, looks like fixed. We not only need to allow to the backend, we also need to allow to the core DNS or cube DNS part. So more DNS, because DNS is really often the problem. We looked at part to part. Next example, we're looking at something that's a little bit more advanced. So 
As we have learned, Kubernetes DNS is used for service discovery. It's usually implemented by Core DNS, but that's actually not mandatory. You can, of course, use a different DNS implementation, and it looks simple. It is not always simple. So let's look at how to troubleshoot something like this. And this is a simple pod in another namespace that simply tries to reach out or intends to reach out to google.com. So let me go over and switch tab. This is same cluster, but I have just one pod in one namespace running. Then is DNS, uh, who is um, doing curl to google.com. And let's say the application team is actually complaining, hey, this is not working. What is going on? Let's go back into the dashboard, and I have the demo DNS. So we've seen this view before, and we can see that the, the dashboard view of how the DNS layer of Kubernetes is doing in general. So we see about 30 DNS requests per second, and we see the, the top 10 DNS, I can make this a bit bigger, we can, make the, we can see the top 10 DNS queries, we can see we're, we're looking up Elasticsearch, Core API, and so on. Then I also see a bunch of DNS errors, right? So we have, we're seeing quite a few of them, and one of them, them is from my Denny's DNS pod. So these are like the, the rate of DNS errors that uh, this DNS or this pod is actually experiencing. We can then go in and actually look at what are the specific um, queries that are making that are not successful, and we see down here that yes, we're trying to look up or curl Google, but the app has spelled Google wrong and was using zeros instead of O's. Of course, that's the dashboard view. We can go back and actually look at the observe view as well. So I go back and I run Hubble observe. This time I'm spe specifying the namespace debug DNS, which is where my application is running in. And here we actually see, yes, we see the communication to kubedns, this, this is UDP. And then we see the actual, layer, the, the actual DNS requests and responses, right? We see here that the, the pod is actually attempting to resolve Google with zeros for both IPv6 and IPv4. I can then even dive deeper and say I actually only want the layer seven information like this. And now it will only show me the resolution paths, like what is the DNS resolution that is going on inside of this namespace. So in here, I can quickly, with the dashboard here, look at is my cluster, are there pods which are experiencing DNS resolutions? And as I've identified those pods, I can use Hubble CLI to go in and actually uh, find out what is specifically going on, what are they trying to look up, and so on. Last example, debugging service latency. Service latency is, let's say you have deployed an application, and the application is not performing as fast as it should be. How are you troubleshooting this? How are you even identifying this? And there is a standard for this, or a best practice for this, called Golden Signal Dashboard that's been invented or written down by the Google SRE team. You can see the information at the bottom. The, it's actually documented pretty well. It's a standard way of monitoring your infrastructure specifically for cases where you're running a service that's publicly available. And the, f the famous four golden signals that matter in this case are latency, traffic or throughput, errors, and saturation. And we'll look at what that actually means and why that's useful. So I go over here and I open up the, the third demo. This is the um, Hubble dashboard for golden signal dash for the, for golden for the four golden signals. We see at the top the request rate, how many requests per second are actually coming in. We're then seeing the request duration, and in this case, this is HTTP. So this is actually the HTTP request to response latency. We can see P50, P95, and P99. These are essentially the tails. So P50 is the worst half of the latency number. P95 is the worst 5%. So 
if you only look at the worst 5% five, 5 of connections with the worst latency took the longest, what is the average over that 5%? And P99 is only the worst 1%. And what really matters is P99 or P95, because on average it often looks good, but then for some customers the experience could be really, really bad. So you really want to not only monitor an average, you want to monitor P99 as well. And it's interesting that we actually see significant peaks here. So the average is actually pretty good. If you would look at uh, P50, that's the green line. It's all the way at the bottom. So if you only look at the average, even of the worst half, everybody's like, yay, happy. Like, it's almost zero. That's probably pretty good. But if you look at P99, it's sometimes up to two seconds. So some requests going into this service have actually experienced a latency of two seconds before they got back a response. That's great. Now we understand that there is a problem in terms of latency. We can also understand that there's actually some problems in terms of errors being returned, which is the second column. We can see this. This is the error rate. So this is the rate of HTTP errors that are being returned by the application. So any sort of HTTP 500 type code. So one source of problem can be the request taking very long, so the service being slow. And another common problem is that the service is crashing and returning an, like an HTTP 500 error code. Both are very meaningful and important to monitor. That's great. Now we know that there are some problems. In order to now actually debug this, we need to correlate this with saturation because we need to understand whether latency is because there is limited available availability of resources, and that's often CPU. So we actually have the HTTP request duration and the CPU usage right next to each other. So I can actually go in here and see whether a spike, I can go in and actually zoom in here, and just let's just look at this spike. I can look whether this spike in latency is caused because there was a spike in CPU usage on that node. And I can do that for both the source and the destination. So if I have two pods running in the cluster, I can measure the latency, and I will see the CPU consumption on the source node and on the destination node. So I can even understand if the latency is bad on the destination side, whether that was caused by limited availability of CPU on the source node side. This is allowing to monitor applications broadly, cluster-wide, to figure out, is my service up and running? Is it returning errors? And how fast is my service actually running? Like, how quick is the app functioning, and so on? And again, all of this is done using transparent extraction of observability data. So this is not using application instrumentation. We're now looking at the, the Grafana dashboard of this, but all of this data is also available as open telemetry metrics and uh, traces as well. So you can also visualize this in other tooling that is open telemetry capable. And with that, I think we have a couple of minutes left for questions. This was like a quick overview. Well, please, thank you. If you want to learn more, Cilium.io, where you find information about Cilium and Hubble. Or if you want to ask me questions afterwards, feel free to re reach out on Twitter. Um, now I think there are mics left and right in case you want to ask questions, but I also know that it is lunchtime. <laughs> uh, hey. This side. Hello. Uh, just, just one qu simple question and fast, I hope. So, uh, okay. Uh, Let's say we would like to use Cilium, but we use OpenShift now. And OpenShift has uh, now, we don't use OpenShift CNI, but OpenShift OVN. Uh, do you know if they are compatible? I mean, can we add Cilium over OpenShift and don't break everything? <laughs> yes, you can run chaining, CNI chaining modes, where you can run Cilium, just the Hubble portion on top of OpenShift SDN or OVN and so on, absolutely. Okay. Mm. But Cilium is also available on OpenShift if you want to replace it. Both are possible. Mm -hmm. 
I see you. Thank you. Hi. Um, I have a question regarding as a network plugin. Uh, what does a network plugin like Calco or Selenium provide, not provide by uh, EKS, VPC, CNI? Um, uh, what will make me choose uh, the network plugin and uh, not the cloud plugin? Especially, I feel the VPC CNI makes the life easy. So it makes the, the pod uh, reachable or accessible inside the VPC. Also, if I will use a um, controller, a load balancer controller, uh, and I use the IP uh, target, so uh, the request can reach to the pod directly without pass or without go to the API uh, server. So yeah, that's a question. Yes, yeah, so I think a good, often a motivation to run Selim on top of the VPC and I, CNI in EKS would be to install Hubble on top or the network policy implementation. So it's just like we've heard for OpenShift, you can run on top of the VPC, VPC CNI. You can also run Cilium natively in what's called ENI mode, in which case it can, just like the VPC, VPC CNI plugging itself, natively route all of the pod traffic, so you don't need to run Cilium in what's called o overlay mode. Was that your question? I'm not 100% sure whether I got it right. Yeah, so what we will provide for me if I put it uh, um, on top of, of the CNI. So CNI now provide me the network or implement the network and make the pod already accessible. So, and also decrease the latency. So what this will add to my configuration or my implementation? What can, is the main feature for that? Can you repeat the last part? I didn't fully understand it. Yeah, so I mean, uh, if I have CNI and after that I installed Selenium in top of the CNI, I mean VPC CNI, what is the feature for that? What we will add more to my implementation? I see, okay, so the VPC, is, VPC CNI, at least as my understanding right now, does connectivity. Yep. And there is, of course, QProxy already running, so yeah. the service implementation. Mm. And I think there already is, or there is an upcoming network policy implementation. Mm. What does not exist in there is all the observability that we've seen today, which is needed for the troubleshooting. Then Silim also has functionality such as cluster mesh, mm. service mesh, Tetragon. All of these are, are not available mm. in the, the VPC CNI plugin, so the extended functionality. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, a good question as well. Uh, we are currently using Istio with Kiali on top, which provides a very similar set of capabilities with what you were just describing for Hubble. Uh, so what would be the benefit of switching from one to the other? Because, well, there is, of course, the service mesh level and the CNI level, and like, what's the difference that that gives you? So I think the difference for most users will be that if you don't have a service mesh yet, you can get this easily just natively from Cilium. You don't need to actually deploy a full service mesh. If you are, if you are already running Istio, then Cilium provides very similar observability data. We even implement the same open standards. Um, there, are, there can be some performance differences depending on how you run Istio, ambient mesh versus the traditional Istio and so on, that you would have to look into in detail. So the, the, the difference is less in capability, but more on the architectural model, potentially the um, um, performance of it, and so on. Let's go ahead. I was trying to, thanks for a great presentation, first of all, and I was trying to come up with a question. We, I'm trying to troubleshoot the problems uh, from AWS ALBs talking to the Kube cluster itself, and a lot of times I see that there is like re connection to target errors or so. So like based on the observed like investigation that I call it is somewhere we're, we're suspecting that the target, the pod is basically, basically still not ready, but the traffic is still trying, like trying, there are attempts to route it there. If there is something like, is it anyhow the use case of Hubble that can help us with troubleshooting all those things? Yes, or, absolutely. Because if that is happening, Mm -hmm. On the network, you typically receive what's called a reset, a TCP reset, because the port is not yet open. There's even a Hubble filter 
that allow or a dashboard that shows you those parts, right? Where mm -hmm. you're reaching out to a service, maybe the back end, the replicas are still scaling up or they're already scaling down. And this is actually recognizable on the network because typically you don't have a lot of reset, TCP resets in your Kubernetes network. Mm -hmm. So that's often a pattern that you can see. Uh, if you know the specific service, then with the the observe with this view, with the Hubble observe view here, with the CLI, you could actually see each reset. So you could see mm -hmm. the service drying out, and then instead of just not receiving anything back, you will get back the the, um, the reset. I can show you an example on on how that looks like. Yeah. So that's how how many Cilium users actually troubleshoot this. Because we suspect it's more like not on the service itself level, but maybe when the node itself spins up. Yeah. So at that time. So it somehow show that the node is already ready, yes. and even the slowdown side, so like ALBs should wait. So if, if you're yeah. running Cilium in those scenarios, the node is still, okay, that's an op I'm, that's I, a motivation. I know that we, we, I've seen the Hubble dashboard <laughs> yeah. for, the, for the new cluster we just launched, and we see the same, exactly the same problems. And I think at that time we were using EKS, because before yeah. it was for the self-hosted cluster. So there is there is Hubble somehow. Inside. There is I'm Hubble, sure. yeah, okay. Yeah. And and if you already run Cilium in that, in that when the node is still coming out, there's actually a specific error, a specific drop reason that you will see that this went to a node that does either not exist or is not available yet. So if it even gets to the nodes, but the Cilium is not ready there or the node is not ready yet, Cilium will actually report you the specific reason why it could not deliver the packet. So that could be a motivation to run the Cilium CNI plugin. You said I can see a demo, how can I? Yeah. We, can I just come up or? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Hey, so um, I have a couple of questions. Um, great presentation, firstly. Um, so we want to migrate away from Calico uh, to Cilium. We run on-prem. So all the fun stuff that goes with on-prem clusters. Um, is there a migration document that we can follow? I asked the booth, and apparently there isn't one. Is there anything in the works? There, there is. Even better, there's actually a video recording of Duffy Cooley uh, migrating, I think, from Calico, but I'm not quite sure. But yes, yeah, so migration paths exist. And there is uh, on the Echo newsletter, which is the EVPF and Cilium newsletter and, 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 and show, there's actually a migration episode on how to migrate to Cilium. That can be a great starting point. And then the next step, if that's not enough, ping us on Slack. We're, we're happy to help. Um, we may have a more formal, more official migration path or documentation path soon. The trouble with that is often there is not just one way to run other CNI plugins. So it often really depends on are you running, let's say, Calico in BGP mode, or are you running that in the cloud? Are you using that or policy? Are you using Calico net or policy? And so on. That's why it's not just a flip of a switch. Okay. Um, and the next question was so we um, run vanilla Kubernetes across. Um, couple of sites and Azure too. So um, if we were to use Cilium and Hubble, Hubble UI, how will traffic show when it goes through several other layers of infrastructure like firewalls, gateways, etc.? So we obviously have access to the virtual machines, but the infrastructure teams manage the firewalls. So um, how will that show on Hubble? Would it actually show as next hops or what will Hubble do with that traffic? Unless you do something and run something on those middle boxes, you will not see anything. But you can actually, if you want, install Hubble on them if you want the observability data. Um, often, Cilium users will then replace, for example, the external load balancer with the Cilium load balancer, and then you get the observability data. But if you run Cilium in overlay mode, it will not actually even care about what the underlying infrastructure looks like. And as such, you will not see any details. But you will see, so Cilium will warn you if it transmitted on one node and it did not receive on the other node, which will stand usually the indication that the underlying network dropped it somewhere. Right. Okay, cool. Thanks. Oh, by the way, you can see, typically, if it's L3 routers, you can compare the, the TCP TTL on the sending and the receiving node, then you at least know how many routers you had in, in, in between. Cool, thank you. Uh, I have a question regarding the L7 uh, detection. The, I mean, uh, you showed the, with the, the command line tool in the UI that yep. uh, there was some information about uh, uh, the L7. Uh, I wanted to ask, in case uh, we have a TLS, do we still have some information about uh, L7 
protocol used? The answer is it depends. So if you are using Cilium to do the TLS, then yes. If the application is doing the, 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 the TLS itself, then the answer is by default no. But with KTLS, we can optionally if the application allows for this. And then if you're running a service mesh to do MTLS, then Hubble can also see it because it's unencrypted up until to the, to the proxy. But if the application itself does TLS, and if the application does not want to be EVE drops on, then we cannot see it. That would break that okay. would break the security model. There are some ways to do that with view probes in the app, yeah. um, but that's not really reliable. So we can demo that, uh, like many others as well, but it's not something we recommend to run in production because it's not 100% guaranteed. Okay, thank you. Hi. Uh, you mentioned that like, uh, we, we, there are traces from uh, Hubble and Cilium companies. What, what are they? Or, like, what kind of information I can get from them? So traces, we do open telemetry traces. We can do HTTP traces with request response spans with the latency, the ret return code, all of this. We can also do traces for the DNS resolution, which is interesting. So you actually see you can see the whole trace and then the spans, including the DNS resolution, so you actually know how long the DNS resolution take, took. And then we also have TCP traces support as well. So for whatever HTTP or layer seven protocol we support, as well as for the underlying protocol, we can emit open telemetry traces with uh, spans. And then if you want to add additional instrumentation via open telemetry, application instrumentation, you can combine that together. So if you want to have spans inside of the app um, or including trace, uh, including trace, I, trace ID support. OK, cool. And, se and second question going to be uh, about routing uh, of L7 level layer 7 protocols like HTTP one, like in case of service mesh, like is it really possible with Cilium? I mean, like the build some custom logic uh, with uh, some specific URLs, et cetera, like, like the things that like Istio can do, right? So Cilium implements the ingress standard and the gateway API standard. So whatever you can do with either of them, you can fully perform URL rewrites, path-based routing, header-based routing, canary rollouts. Then we have some annotations on both of them. And then as the most sophisticated, most powerful uh, API, we have an, what's called an Envoy CRD which allows you to configure direct Envoy configuration. So whatever is possible to configure in an Envoy listener, you can use. So the full Envoy feature configuration that's available in a so-called listener, you can actually configure for retries or for specific TLS termination that is going beyond what's possible in Ingress and Gateway API. So is it correct that it's not happening in the inside of the kernel, right? I mean, it's... The Correct. So okay, all of yeah, the layer yes. seven load balancing is being done with Envoy. Yeah, we have course. some observability into layer seven using eBPF, but the um, the load balancing, retries, rate limiting on layer seven is all done through Envoy. We do have an MTLS model that does not rely on a proxy, but that has, does, has nothing to do with HTTP or any layer seven processing. That's purely on the on the on the on the layer four right okay cool thanks hi so we are also running calico on prem and i was wondering whether it's possible assuming the worst case so we cannot migrate to Cilium for some reason so whether we can run hubble on top of calico and have the same observability metrics and whatsoever so yes you can chain Cilium on top of Calico and run Hubble. It does have some limitations because the some of the layer seven observability into HTTP, the, the, the Envoy injection we're doing that relies on using a particular feature that Calico also uses right now. So that specific aspect is currently not compatible, but um, everything else, I would say roughly 95% what you have seen today is possible to run on top of Calico, absolutely. And does it require any change from an application level, or is no, it completely transparent? It's completely. You are changing your CNI configuration to also launch Cilium next to Calico on top of it, and then it will not actually do the routing. 
You can even still have Calico do the network policy if you want, or you can say, I'm migrating away from Calico network policy and I'm using Cilium network policy, and then in either way, do the, do the observability on top. That is possible. Okay, so the traffic is going to uh, Cilium and then down to Calico and then it's going... Yes. Okay. Clear. I mean, Calico actually only uses the standard. So if you're running Calico in the default configuration, then it's just using Linux networking. There's nothing too special about it. If you're using Calico in eBPF mode, then it would use that eBPF. Um, um, and but both are, both are compatible, I think. Would there be maybe performance issues by running two CNI on one on, one on top of each other? Well, like only running one is definitely more efficient than running two. Um, we would have to run it. Um, if you are not doing anything with Cilium, right, the overhead is very small, I'd say overall, right? Like, as you configure a lot of things in Cilium, there, there is overhead. And then it will depend on how much observability you want, which will also then uh, dictate how much overhead you have. But in general, that is definitely 100% feasible, and we have many Cilium users that are doing this. Okay, thank you. Hello. Hello. Uh, we're thinking about shifting from AWS to GCP, but we know that Hubble isn't available in GKE. So do you know if it will change someday or if there is an alternative to that? You can run Cilium on all the cloud providers natively. I can obviously not speak to when the cloud providers would enable specific functionality in their version of um, Cilium. I know that some of them are considering to bring Hubble, but you can run Cilium, to my understanding, on all the cloud provider as a replacement CNI or in chaining mode on top. In particular, of course, on AWS, that's common. Um, and that's actually what a lot of users and isovalent customers are running. Okay. I think we got all the questions. Ah, one more, one more. One more. Sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, two more, two more. We, we are also an OpenShift, OpenShift customer and we are using OpenShift with default OpenShift SCN. It uses IP tables. Uh, currently, we have a cluster IP service, and the clients are uh, calling th this service in a high rate, and uh, we are creating lots of TC new TCP connections, and we are close to consume all the available TCP source ports. Mm -hmm. uh, in the Cilium implementation, I think you are replacing the cluster IP address with the real endpoint IP address during the TCP connect times. Does this implementation uh, increase the number of tuples so, and it increases the number of the usable TCP source ports. Very good point. Um, we have a good answer for you because when Cilium implements the load balancing with QProxy replacement, we actually use our own connection tracking table, which you can set the limit for. So, that solves limit number one. And then if you're really running out of tuples overall, I would recommend that you are using the socket-based load balancing, which does the load balancing at the socket connect system time, which is incredibly more scalable. If you ping me on Slack, I can give you pointers on that uh, to get you started. Uh, thanks for the demo. So since GKE Data Plane V2 uses Cilium, um, I was wondering if that's compatible with Hubble because I did a quick search and said that um, the Hubble UI wasn't available because the agents are, don't expose the ports, but I was just interested in whether the CLI observe tool would work. Um, I know that there is work to enable Hubble on GKE. I do, I'm not aware of the latest status as of now. In okay. the initial version, it was, not, it was not enabled, but I think the Google team is working on uh, enabling Hubble. As soon as the Hubble API is exposed, then the dashboards and the Hubble CLI will work to some extent because they may actually not immediately enable all of the Hubble functionality. For example, the DNS observability or the layer seven observability. That's a question to ask for Google what they will actually specifically um, enable there. Okay, I follow the project, thanks. Awesome. Thank you, thank you very much again.